Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics Course 01. This is Class 01, which is a standalone Ether argument. This is a new argument for the existence of the Ether, which extrapolates the concept from a simple coupling argument. This does not rely on new electromagnetism or any field models, and therefore stands on its own. And the intent of this is hopefully to carry along as many people as possible without having to confuse them with field theory. So let's begin with a simple thought experiment. What you see here is a toy car, like let's say a Pinewood Derby kind of car that's in a track. A child is going to play with this car by pushing on it, and the, the force that's going to oppose the child pushing it, the, applied, the force felt by the child as he tries to push the car, the reaction force, is going to be some function of the velocity and the acceleration. The car, let's say, is at position X from the beginning of the track. And so the first derivative of x, dx dt, is also known as velocity. And the second derivative of dx dt is known as acceleration. Okay, and we call this, because this is the second derivative, we call that the second order term, which includes a coefficient. This is the first order term. Okay, the x itself would be the zero order term. But Right now, there is no force that can be implied by the position of the car, the x being the position, uh, because it's on a flat track. And KAF is the axle friction, so as the kid pushes it, there's going to be friction in the axle, friction, a little friction on the road surface. And KI is the inertia of the car, which is typically in classical science is pretty much the mass of the car. So, but what about the air? I mean, the air is kids pushing it through the, well, of course, the kid's not going to push it with enough real speed to make the air a significant contributor to the felt reaction as the kid pushes the car, but it is there nonetheless. It's, it's a medium that the car is actually coupling to. And so if we decide to make this a more complete model, we can add the air viscosity into the first order term and the inertia of the air, how, you know, to move the air around the car would be in the second order term. This would be the first order term and this would be the second order term here. But what if we take this one step further and we put a slot underneath the track? The kid can't see the, the slot in the track, let's say. We connect a cannonball to the car. Well, this added inertia is going to make the car feel real heavy to the child. As it, the, the felt inertia of that car is going to increase because of this extra mass. And so we add the inertia of the cannonball into the second order term. But let's take this even further. What if instead of the cannonball, we put a, a trough of water and coupled to the car is a little paddle that sits in the water? Well, now we have a more complex coupling to the car that's going to give both first order effects, which would be the viscosity of the medium, and the inertia of the medium, which would be in the second order. And so now the child is going to feel a co complex effect based on how fast and how much he tries to accelerate the car the car, mass of the car is going to change, or the apparent heaviness, if you, for lack of a better term, of the car is going to change. And as he pushes the car and lets it go, instead of going, it's going to slow down real quickly because of the dampening effect of the viscosity of the water. So the behavior of the vehicle is going to change based on how it's coupled to the medium. Now, if we put a big vat of molasses down here, well, molasses unlike the water, which was going to be more of a term inertial area than the viscosity area, the viscosity being the first order term, inertia being the second order term. But molasses has a lot more viscosity, and so that's going to make the car feel like it's not even going to move. It's like you can push it really hard, but it's going to slow down real fast. So, so the coupling behavior is, the coupling that's felt by the child is going to change by the behavior of the medium that the car is coupled to. Okay, and you can see by the behavior of the medium we could move from the water, which would mostly be a second order effect, to molasses, which would be mostly a first order effect. So we can change, based on the, the properties of the medium, we can change where the effects sit, whether they sit in the second order term or the first order term. And we can affect this as well if we just make the paddle so much bigger that it almost eludes water from passing from one side to the other, we can actually switch water from being more of a second order effect to more of a first order effect because we're preventing, it's very difficult for all that water to gush in that little gap 
And so how we couple to the medium and what kind of medium we have all affect what the apparent heaviness and behavior of the car feels as the child tries to push it. So again, how an object couples to the medium will be determined if its opposition to applied force is first, second, or a combination of both. Now, if we took two cars, put them on the track in the water trough, and I take, and the kid, child takes his car and wiggles it back and forth, well, what's going to happen is he's going to create waves in the tank, and then sooner or later, eventually, this car will start moving back and forth. So now we have a force at distance effect. We basically have an idea where one thing is moving and the other thing feels the effect at a distance. So we're coupling to the medium and that would be the analogy for light and radio. Now if we took the two cars and we applied pumps to them that would suck the medium out and throw it somewhere else, well in between the two paddles the fluid would be sucked out and a depression would occur and the force would start pulling these two cars together because we're going to be pulling the stuff out of the center faster than the outside and therefore there's going to be a net force from these higher pressure as water wants to go from higher pressure to lower pressure and you'll get what will appear to be a gravity like effect and in fact because this force will be based on position this is actually a zero order term so now we have explained zero, first, and second order coupling, all based on a medium that these cars are coupling to. So let's extrapolate that analogy. Here we have a cannonball, a three-inch cannonball, which is represented by a whole bunch of particles. Don't forget the little dark shaded area. That, I shouldn't have put that there. Uh, just look at the little dots. This cannonball is highly dense, much more dense than the, the foam rubber ball. Let's say these are both three inches. I, I don't have a three inch foam rubber ball. But this one has very little coupling to the meat, very light feeling. This one's very heavy and, you know, it's, it's heavy. So if this is all based on a coupling of a medium, well, if, it, it follows that, that this brass is, has a lot more particles per square inch than the foam rubber ball. And therefore, instead of paddles in the water, what we have is particles in an ether. And the number of particles that engage the ether will affect the apparent ability to push this back and forth as opposed to this, which is really easy. There's a lot less coupling because there's a lot less particles. Okay, and gravity, it's, which, haven't, which we'll explain later, gravity, all massive bodies consume ether. That's the reason for the water pumps. And so as the earth is consuming the ether and the ether is trying to flow down, the ether flowing into the earth is coupling to the ball and dragging it earthward, earthward. But now the question is, is this coupling first order or second order? Well, conventional wisdom would tell us that the behavior of the medium, that inertia and gravity are mostly second order effects. Okay, now, with that said, what we're going to show you as this develops is that there is a first order effect. But that effect is so, so, so small, it will probably not be measurable with our instruments. It's something you'd have to observe over hundreds or even thousands of years. So the coupling of these objects to the medium is a factor of how many particles per square inch they have, their density. Density. That is the engineering term for that. And the coupling is mostly second order, which is mass times acceleration. Now, before you all run down to the patent office thinking, oh, I'm just going to develop a space propulsion device where we're going to take, let's say, a plate and have it go this way and then go around a track, and so its, its aspect relative to ether is zero, and then come back around and then push. It doesn't work that way. And the reason why is the density of these are not, okay, because they're, they're, the particles are so far apart, it doesn't matter if you move it this way or move it this way, you get the same effect. There's no, not like water, you know, with water, you can push the water, you can see I can make waves. But if I do it this way, I can't really make waves because of the aspect engaging the medium. But that's not the way matter is to the ether. Matter to the ether is basically like a whole bunch of particles. Oh, I broke it, didn't mean to break it. Let me see if I can't hold this together. See, so, you know, if I take this high density as opposed to a low density, 
And you, now watch the wakes in front around the screws. You'll see that the wakes around the screws actually work together. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. They overlap with each other, and so the wakes work together, and I can produce a pretty good wave phenomenon. And when I go like this, the lead screws and the ones following all follow within their action happening on the water. Okay, but matter relative to the ether is virtually non-existent, and so matter is more like this, where if you see the wakes, the wakes avoid each other, the wakes go between the screws and don't touch each other, and so I'm not really able to produce much of a wave phenomenon this way, and I get about the same effect when I go this way. So it doesn't matter which way I move this, I'm going to be affecting the water the same. The aspect of this does not matter with how it moves in the ether. Okay, and let me show you what, what that was on paper in case you didn't see it. So in case that wasn't clear to you, let me show you what was going on on paper. If you have a case of the very low density matter, as the screws are moving through the water this way, they generate wakes as, as they snow plow the water and the water flows around them, they generate wakes like this. And because the wakes pass through without touching the other screws, these screws move through the water without affecting each other regardless of how they're oriented in the water. They don't, they don't reinforce, they don't work together. They're as if they're moving through the water independently of each other, so it doesn't matter which way the aspect ratio is. But now if you take a higher density material where you have higher density of particles such that the particles to the left and right now intersect the wakes and they generate their own wakes which intersect to the particles to their other sides, whatever. Now they're coupling with the wakes of their neighbors and therefore the density is such that they have an interaction with each other as they couple with the medium and therefore this higher density material is going to have more difficulty passing through the water this way than it does this way. And therefore the aspect ratio will matter. And so what normal matter is made of, even the most heaviest normal matter that's available to humans is so light compared to the ether, is so non-coupling to the ether that you're never going to come up with a situation like this. All matter can be treated like this where its aspect ratio relative to the ether doesn't matter as it moves through the ether. As if it did, then when you weigh this plate, it would weigh more like this because it has a higher aspect ratio to the ether flowing into the earth because in ethereal mechanics, and we're going to show this in another video, massive objects consume the ether and the ether flows toward the massive objects and therefore the reason why things fall is because they're caught in the ether falling earthward. And that means that if ether is flowing down into the ground, then this would weigh more on a scale in this orientation than it would in this orientation where it would have less aspect to the ether. But we know that this weighs the same regardless of orientation, which means it's more like the first case where the particles that make up the material are so far apart that the wakes from the particles moving the ether do not interact. In fact, in reality, in, in the ether world, these particles are so far apart that even the wakes diminish before they would reach their neighbor. So even like, you know, so the wakes do not travel very much outside of the particle itself. The wakes will diminish, where in the water the wakes kind of go for a long way. But in the ether, the wakes diminish real fast because there's so much distance between the particles. I mean, the calculation I did to show you, give you an example of how non-existent matter is relative to the ether, that if you filled up 1,500 Olympic-sized swimming pools, filled them top to bottom with carbon, you know, charcoal, whatever, and you were to compress all of the space out between the protons, electrons, and neutrons, the, all of the volume of those particles would occupy the space of an M&M. &M. That shows you how much empty space is in matter. 
in reality, even though this feels like a really heavy cannonball, this is virtually non-existent relative to the ether. There's almost nothing here. It feels like a lot to me because I'm made of the same very fluffy stuff. So one of the analogies I made in one of the other videos is a bubble may seem like nothing to us, but a bubble to another bubble is a pretty heavy thing. You know, you ever attach two bubbles together, you know, like the bubbles you blow with the bubble solution when you were a kid? You put another bubble on a bubble, that other bubble stretches under the weight of the other bubble, but a bubble to you and me is nothing. So how massive something is is all relative. We feel this as being massive because relative to us, it's massive. I mean, it's very heavy. But again, this is very light. It's like not even there. So normal matter is virtually non-existent. And because it's virtually non-existent, the, way, the wakes and the disturbances of the ether as particles move through do not reach out and touch their neighbors. And therefore, the aspect of an object moving through the ether is of no relevance. Now, maybe in the future, we're going to find some special material where it does matter. We're not there yet. And that was the water analogy. So I've introduced a model for inertia which is based on a simple coupling analogy to a pervasive medium which we're going to call the ether. Okay, this model does not require knowledge of EM theory as does the previous arguments and so I hope to make this knowledge more accessible to more people. From this basic idea in this first course we will explain everything from Newtonian physics to relativity and black holes with little or no discussion of new electromagnetism. Thank you very much.